um, anatta, not self. Uh, this is the first of two talks on not self. Um, first one tonight, second one uh, next week. Um, and in this one, this one is called "Is Anyone Here?" And its aim is to give the the background to the Buddha's understanding of self and not self. Um, and in order to give this background, unfortunately, the talk has to be long, dense, and theoretical. Uh, so I apologize in advance. Uh, you might feel like you're attending some kind of university. Uh, but it, if you get it, then it gives you um, a sense of where the Buddha is coming from when he starts talking about anatta, not self. Uh, and next week it will be more, perhaps more, perhaps could be described as more practical in emphasis. So let's begin. And, and let's begin with the Bodhisattva's decision to renounce home and search for awakening. Now, you're all familiar with the story of the Buddha. Before he was the Buddha, he was the Bodhisattva. And he lived at Kapilavastu, who was the capital of, of the Shakya Republic which uh, generally people think is in, in what is now southern Nepal. Now Kapilavastu lay on the main trading route between the kingdom of Kosala to the west and the Vajji confederacy to the southeast. Uh, so um, if the Buddha stepped out of his house and turned to the right and headed, headed down that main road, he would eventually reach Kos, uh, Kosala the capital of, uh, so he would eventually reach Savati, which was the capital of Kosala. And in fact, it's where later he made his headquarters. Or he could turn left to the, uh, 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 and head southeast to the Vajji Confederacy with its capital at Vasali. So he chose to turn left and head to Vasali. So why did he do that? Why did he turn left instead of right? So this, uh, the Vajji Confederacy, this is a confederation of tribal republics, and it was, it was located in what is now northern Bihar state. And it was the successor to the kingdom of Videha. And Videha for centuries had been a major center for yogic traditions uh, that we know through the Upanishads. So if you've ever looked at the Upanishads, especially the early Upanishads, which you're reading was set in this uh, kingdom. Uh, and it was in Videha in particular that the Brahad Aranika Upanishad or the Great Forest Upanishad was composed. And this is, was and still is one of the major Upanishads. So at the time of the Buddha, which is sometime after this, the, this area remains a place where aspiring yogis would go to study and practice the Dharma. So that's why he goes there. Now, to get a sense of what was going on, let's look at Brahad Aranika Upanishad. In its current form that we have it, it's basically a collection of texts that preserve the teaching of the sage Yajna Valkya, who was a native of Videha. Like the early Buddha suttas are a collection of texts that preserved the teaching of the Buddha. Um, now, Yajna Valkya is, was and is an extremely important figure in uh, Indian religion. He was a founding teacher of the Advaita Vedanta tradition of non-dualism. And he lived several centuries before the Buddha. And one of his central teachings was the doctrine of Atman, self. Now, Atman, uh, Atman is the eternal, blissful essence that is found at the heart of subjective experience. When we practice, that's what we're going for. So the purpose of practice in this tradition is to uncover the Atman and then allow it to express itself in our lives. Now, the Bodhisattva joined this tradition he trained with at least two teachers that are named in the early discourses, Alara Kamala and Uttaka Ramaputta, and mastered the meditation that, he, that they taught. And then, uh, quite famously or infamously at the time, he rejected this tradition as inadequate 
He had mastered it. He was invited to be a teacher. He said, no, I'm out of here. So he keeps going south and he goes south of the Ganga, the Ganges, and he reaches the kingdom of Magadha. Now, this is the second major kingdom of the Ganges Valley at the time. And he heads to the south of that, to, this, to the district where the major city was Gaia. Now, this district was known for its powerful, restless spirits and the shamans who dealt with them. So it's a very powerful, energetic place and still is to this day. Uh, and there he practiced independently with no teacher that, he, that alone tells you something. And the practice that he took up was one of extreme asceticism. So when that failed, he developed his own way of practice, which he called the middle way. And through this, he gained awakening. So this is the background. Now, why is it relevant to our understanding of not self? Anatta, or in Sanskrit, an Atman. Um, as we've seen, Atman, self, was central to the Bodhisattva's training and practice. Absolutely central to it. Once he's awakened, and he's a teacher in his own right, he flips, and instead of teaching Atman, he teaches an Atman, or in Pali, Anatta. In other words, he taught the opposite of what he had been taught. Now, this was shocking and scandalous to his contemporaries. So why did he do this? Why did he go this opposite path or contrary path? What was he trying to communicate? So this is what we want to explore tonight. Uh, by the way, if you've got any question, because this is, get, can get a bit technical, uh, just uh, interrupt me and ask. Are you all happy so far? or so discombobulated, you just don't want it all. Okay, we'll keep going. So, now if the Buddha taught an Atman, not Atman, then if we, if we go to understand what he was getting at, we need to understand Atman. In other words, we need to understand what is it that he's rejecting. Now, the first thing to recognize is that Atman in this tradition has, in the tradition of the Upanishads, has two aspects. And we often don't get, get that. We, we, we often just mix them up. We don't recognize that they're actually quite distinct. The Atman is both metaphysical and it is psychological. It's both. So, and the teaching of Atman is both metaphysical and psychological. So it's metaphysical in that it transcends the person. So in other words, it's, it's itself. But how many in this tradition, how many Atmans are there in the world? How many, how many selves are there in the world? Well, the answer is one. There's one single Atman that transcends all individual differences. And so it transcends ordinary empirical experience. So this is the metaphysical Atma. But how is it, how is it to be found? How can you express it if you do find it? Well, it's found and it's expressed through the ordinary empirical person. In other words, Atman is also psychological. And the psychological Atman is both the road to the metaphysical Atman, and it's the instrument through which this metaphysical Atman is expressed in the world. So this is how you can recognize someone, oh, he has experienced Atman through how he behaves or how she lives. So it's both metaphysical and psychological. Um, does that make sense? Okay. Let's, Let's optimistic, optimistically carry on. Um, now, when the Buddha is teaching um, anatta, an atman, to his audience, his educated audience would have been deeply familiar with his whole tradition. On the other hand, his uneducated students, like the peasantry, or the working class, they were probably ignorant of the details of this tradition and their concern probably would have been on 
their focus would have been on the psychological aspect of Atma, because this is what falls in the, into the range of their experience. And in general, of course, we are in that second category of the uneducated, ignorant ones. So that's where our focus is. Um, now, this, this metaphysical Atman, it does emerge in different beliefs. So, for example, in the Hindu Atman traditions, they believe in um, rebirth or reincarnation. Who or what is reborn? It's the Atman. Uh, in Christian Atman tradition, Atman is the soul, and it's the Atman who goes to an eternal reward in heaven or eternal punishment in hell. Uh, and then the psychological Atma, this emerges as the one who acts, the one who reaps the results of action, the one who is aware of the world. So this is the self who identifies as the one who does things, the one who possesses things, like, for example, a body and a mind. And the, the Atman is the psychological Atman is the one who is in charge of his or her actions. So the one who takes responsibility for the fact that I turned up here tonight for this meeting. So in other words, the psychological Atman is the person to whom it makes sense to refer to my body, my mind, my actions. Whenever we think, speak or perceive in that way, we are invoking the psychological Atma. Does that make sense? Uh, now, the Atman, both in both terms of both metaphysical and psychological, the Atman represents our fundamental point of reference. So Atman self is the place from which we experience the world. So I experience a wide world, but where do I experience it from? From here, and it goes out. And equally, it's the place to which the world refers. So the world comes here. So in ordinary experience, for example, we, we, we all have the sense that, for example, this is happening to me and the me to whom experiences happen is Atman, self. So we have a deep sense that this is my life. And the Atman is the owner of this life. So Atman is the reference against which everything in our lives is measured. So it's, it's extremely important. Um, so, of course, what we want to know is, why did the Buddha reject it? What problem does he see? Um, now, he, he, the Buddha rejects both the metaphysical and the psychological, psychological Atman, but mostly he focuses on the psychological Atman. For him, that's what's central. Now, what's the difference between them? One difference is that the metaphysical Atman is beyond actual experience. You don't actually experience the metaphysical Atma, it's transcendent. But the psychological Atma would appear, at least in principle, to be available to experience. So the psychological Atma is the place where I find my identity. So who I perceive myself to be, who I think myself to be. And the Buddha is interested only in actual human experience. This is really important for understanding where he's coming from. He's just interested in the nature of experience. He's not interested in anything else. Um, so uh, to give to, to give the, um, the example, in, in Balahad Aranika Upanishad, the Arjuna Valkya, great sage, he raises the problem of how we can experience Atma, given its transcendent. And he says, and this is a very important passage, he says, you cannot see the seer from seeing. You cannot hear the hearer from hearing. You cannot think the thinker from thinking. 
you cannot know the knower from knowing. Now, to get a sense of what he's talking about, ask yourself the question, what is the one thing we cannot see? The one thing in the physical world we cannot see. Instead of asking for possible responses, I'll just give you the answer. We cannot see our own eyes. We can see the reflection of our eyes in a mirror, but we cannot see our eyes. And why not? Because sight proceeds out from our eyes. So whatever we see is not our eyes. Uh, whatever we see is not Atma, not the one who sees, because the one who sees is back here, whereas vision is going out there. So everything we see, we hear, we think, we know is not Atma. Or in Pali, it is anatta, not self. Now you can see that, Yajna, that the Buddha it, it would agree with this. He would say, spot on, Yajna Valkya is not a complete idiot. Yet, where they separate is because Yajna Valkya does believe in Atma. So how does, how does this work? So let's come back to our, the, our example of seeing. We cannot see our own eyes. But does this mean we don't have eyes? Like if someone came up and said, look, I've never seen my eyes, I can't see my eyes. So I realize that eyes actually don't exist. Would you think this is a brilliant philosopher? Or do you think this person is a complete nutcase and they, and they need assistance? Now we know that we have eyes because we do in fact see. In other words, we infer the existence of our eyes without ever seeing them. We know that we have ears because we do in fact hear and so on. So for Yajna Valkya, the Atman, the self, is the one who sees, the one who hears, the one who smells, tastes, touches, knows. The Atman is the one who experiences. So since it's obvious that we experience, then it's equally obvious that there is one who experiences. And we do not directly experience Atman because Atman lies behind experience. Atman is what undergoes experience. Atman is what makes experience itself possible. So Yajna Valkya infers the existence of the one who knows, the Atman, because in fact we know even though we can never know the one who knows. Now, this is where the Buddha parts company with Yajna Valkya. He refuses to make that move. He refuses to make that inference. The Buddha is a radical empiricist. He's interested only in the nature of human experience. If something is beyond the range of our experience, he's not interested in it, and he does not want to say anything about it. He does not say it exists. He does not say it does not exist. He does not move beyond our actual felt experience in order to speculate about what might or might not exist. Anything beyond experience for him is just a cloud of concepts. And so it's not to be relied upon. And you can see it in his approach to different um, teachers and teachings that when he's faced with a competing belief system, uh, typically he would investigate the experience this belief is based on. So what's your, what's your experience upon which you build this belief? And this is why he's got no interest at all in the metaphysical Atman, because even to its followers, it's beyond experience. So the Buddha's got no time for it. And that's the same reason why he's got no time for belief in the creator God. Exactly the same reason. Uh, Craig, you've got a question. Yeah, thanks, Patrick. Uh, possibly a, a, a dumb or an obvious question, but where does rebirth fit into that? Um, the, the, the tradition makes it absolutely clear that there is rebirth, but no one is reborn. And in fact, the, the fact that there is no one who is reborn is what makes rebirth possible. And this is something that a lot of people, including a lot of Buddhists, lose sight of. 
So even people like faithful Buddhists who believe in rebirth and say, if you're going to be a Buddhist, you've got to believe in rebirth. They present it as a teaching of some kind of post-mortem survival. The Buddha does not teach that. What he says is, as a matter of empirical experience, death follows birth and birth follows death. It just happens in the nature of experience. He doesn't say anybody's born. And he doesn't say anybody's died, anybody dies. Because he assumes not self. But of course, the popular beliefs in not in rebirth, they assume self because people are interested, what happens to me? Am I going to heaven or am I going to hell? So it's conflated so, with reincarnation. What, yeah, so it becomes a reincarnation. Uh, but that's not what he was what not what he's talking about. He's talking about something much more subtle and much more radical, which is why a lot of people miss it. Because it's kind of too spacey, too bizarre. You can't be serious. Okay. Uh, yeah, Christine. Um, I was reading about rebirth, and I thought what I was understanding it was saying was that it's it's the karma that is past for, reborn. Hmm. Like so, the example uh, given was like a, a candle uh, hmm. and the candle flickers to the next candle and that's the sort of the flow of the karma. Hmm. That's how I understood uh, being reborn. Yeah. You know, in other words, it's just the flow of natural processes. Hmm. And karma is particularly important. Karma simply means action, but for the Buddha it hmm. means morally significant action. Hmm. In other words, it's actions that we choose. So mm. it's, it's the whole area of moral responsibility. Now, uh, it's, it's like you, this debate comes up with climate change. Why is the climate changing? Is it because God is angry with us? No, it's, it's, it's a complex natural process. This is why it's mm. happening. Okay, given that this is complex natural process, this is just nature, what should I do about it? That's karma. And of course, people's collective decisions there Karma influence this natural process. It's part of the natural process. So, so the, um, rebirth is very much part of the Buddhist teaching on ethics, and it's all about we have to take responsibility for what we do. We don't kind of there isn't an escape hatch when we die. <laughs> Whatever we do has have, has consequences, and those consequences will roll on into the future, and we've got to do something about this. So then we segue into the whole field of the Buddha's ethics. But again, the underlying assumption is not self. Um, Patrick, I was just going to ask with the re that rebirth, reincarnation uh, concepts, so, because I know with a lot of the, <clears throat> the, the Buddhist monks, they will talk about uh, finding the next reincarnation of some mm. high lama. Uh, this is the reincarnation of that previous mm. uh, yeah, lama. And, you know, so I, I guess I'm just a little bit confused. I understand what you're saying, but it's the, that it's the... the package that was before is presenting maybe in a new outside uh, like wrapping paper, but it's the same package of karma. Do, 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 does that make sense? Like the question that I'm asking? Because, yeah, because they mean, look for a specific person again, like a, a specific collection of qualities, I guess. Hmm. Yeah. They it's like um, it's if you're a, a good enough yogi, it's possible to surf this um, uh, complex flow, so that your particular stream of karma can be directed in a certain direction and be picked up uh, somewhere else. That's the belief system. Uh, the, again, the way it's talked about uh, is, is: oh, there's someone who is reborn, and that same someone. Is there? But I think when the Dalai Lama talks seriously about it, 
I think he makes it clear that that's not actually what, what it is, but that's the popular view. Yeah, so, yeah, okay, yeah. But, so where, where um, that's, if you're, if you're a Buddhist monk or a Buddhist nun and you've got to give a lecture and you've got to inspire people to be good, then the easiest thing is to say, look, if you're good, you go to heaven, and if you're not, you go to hell. So it's kind of roughly in line with, with it, and it's avoid sidestepping all these questions of, wait a minute, if there's no one there, then why can't I do whatever I like? Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> so it's, it's the very practical moral teaching for the masses, basically. But we're, what we're talking about is, because we're interested in the view from the perspective of the practitioner, which means among, let's assume that we think we're Buddhists, we're among a tiny, tiny minority of Buddhists. Okay. So let's, uh, let's move on because otherwise we'll be here all night. So let's um, talk about investigating Atma, investigating self. So when the Buddha starts talking about um, uh, self, he begins, and this is in the Anatalakana Sutta, his third discourse, the, the, the not self characteristic. Uh, he begins with an empirical investigation of the psychological Atma. So by now it's kind of pretty obvious why he's doing this. So here's the dialogue. What do you think? Is body permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, Bhante. And that which is impermanent, is it painful or pleasurable? Painful, Bhante. And that which is painful and subject to change, is it appropriate to regard it in terms of this is mine, I am this, this is myself? Certainly not, Bhante. So this is this very famous kind of catechism that you find in Anatta Lakana Sutta. And the Buddha goes through the five aggregates um, and has the same examination. Now, by now you might be getting, a, be getting a sense of why this argument makes sense to him. So let's look at the first one. What do you think? Is body permanent or impermanent? Now, firstly, notice that this is this question is part of an investigation about the nature of experience. Because when the Buddha says body, what he means is our experience of body. Because it's always about experience. So his first question is, does your physical experience change? Answer, yes. Would anybody vote for no? Never changes? Um, now, for the Buddha, that which changes is subject to pain. Now, why is that? Because it's not just that things change, it's that these changes are out of our control. And so anything we rely upon for support will, by transforming into something else, disappoint us. To be at nature, not permanent, is also to be unreliable, bound to disappoint. Is anybody being disappointed by the tendency of their body to get sick at the most inconvenient times? Has that ever happened? Maybe once or twice? Uh, so this is Dukkha. Um, and so he, he says, and that which is painful and subject to change, is it appropriate to regard it in terms of this is mine, I am this, this is myself. Now notice that these questions are all about the psychological Atma. And he talks about it in terms of three movements. This is mine. I am this. This is myself. Why? And in particular, why does he start with possession? Now next week we're going to go into more about this, but you're just kind of getting a sense of the territory. So let's go back to what we how we started. Remember we said that Atman, self, gives us our fundamental point of reference. It's the place from which we experience the world and to which the world points. So all beings and all things in the world refer back to Atman, to me. So this brings us to the world of possession. Have you ever perceived or thought or spoken of your of body as my body. Has anybody ever mentioned my body? Has anybody ever thought of the body that if you can see when you look down that it's, oh this is my body? 
anybody ever done that? Maybe. Now, what does it mean to refer to a body as my body? Now, it's, first of all, it's ambiguous. So clearly, it includes identification. My body means the same as the body I am. But also, my, quote unquote, implies distance. So here is me, and there is my. So they're separate in the sense that I function as the owner and controller of that over there, which is my. So possession is built up is an inherent part of self, but there is this ambiguity about it. A possession refers to me. It appears as part of me. And yet it's somehow separate from me. Now for the Buddha, this ambiguity lies at the heart of the Atman concept. What is this Atman? Is it this body? Is it something or someone in relationship with this body? So, in other words, although we always relate to me in terms of mine, this relationship of mine, we cannot pin down as any particular experience event. We can't pin this relationship down as anything specific at all. It's ambiguous. It's like you reach for it, you can't quite get hold of it. Now, this ambiguity opens it up to exploitation by drivenness, the urgent necessity to possess, which the Buddha calls tanha. Literally, it means thirst, and we normally translate it as craving. Now, craving is at the heart, for the Buddha, at the heart of the human problem. And it's characterized by a policy of aggressive expansion. Uh, because when can we have enough of mine? So do, do we ever have enough? Now, economists certainly do not believe so. And if mine tends to expansion, so does Atma. And if mine tends to loss, then so does Atman. So, all of which makes Atman harder and harder to pin down. It's not just hard to pin down, but if Atman is supposed to be blissful and unchanging, then it's very hard to see what business it has with the world of craving. Yet craving and Atman are interconnected because possession and Atman are interconnected. So as we said, it's from the perspective of Atman that it makes sense to talk about my body, my thoughts. Otherwise, it makes no sense. It's only Atman that makes that kind of relationship coherent. And if we don't, if we don't have that relationship, Atman itself becomes nonsense. So let's go back to the Buddha's question. This body, is it unchanging? Or does it change? These changes, are you in control of them or not? Do these changes bring you and your body pain? Can you stop any of that change or pain? So this is the, the meditative investigation that the Buddha is launching. So if possessions are subject to change and are not under my control, in what way does it make sense to say they are mine? So this house that I'm moving into, where, which is we're being renovated, if I go out and I come back and I try to get in, but the, key, the, the, um, the lock is being changed. And say I hammer on the door and someone opens the door and says, what are you doing here? And I say, well, this is my house. And they say, no, it isn't, it's mine. <laughs> Slam the door shop. I go to the cops and they say, that house has got nothing to do with you. I have no control over it. How does it make sense? If So how does it make sense to identify with it as mine? Um, so what 
is not mine is not self, not atma. Uh, and the Buddha points out that possessions are always bound up with pain because this relationship of this is mine is necessarily bound up with what he calls clinging, upadana. Uh, in other words, when we examine how Atman functions in our actual experience, again, this is the psychological, psychological Atman, it not only fails as a coherent way of framing our experience, but on top of that, it actually adds to our problem. And again, it's the link with possession and the urge to possess, craving, that is at the heart of the problem. So for the Buddha, he doesn't want to encourage concepts of Atman because any concept we have about Atman, our central reference point, is tied to possessions and the urge to possess. And this means it is ripe for clinging. So it, it doesn't just provide us with an organizing principle for experience. It also provides us with the locus for our clinging and therefore our suffering. Um, now, the Buddha, we, the Buddha talks about tanha and upadana, craving and clinging. Uh, upadana, it's normally translated as clinging or attachment. We're going to have another, get another sense of it uh, next week. Um, and it refers, linguistically, it refers to that which keeps a fire burning. Uh, and the fire here is the threefold fire of greed, hatred and delusion. The fire that emerges as the person I think I am, who struggles to make the world right for me, and is never satisfied with the results of that struggle. So for the Buddha, the psychological Atma is an activity. It's a construction project. It's driven by craving. It's fueled by greed, hatred and delusion. And it creates a great fire that burns us and those around us. The quenching of the fire is Nibbana, or in English, Nirvana. So it's not just that Atman does not make sense for the Buddha, like he finds it incoherent. But more than that, he feels that any concept we have of Atman, any way we have of substantiating it in the world, is bound up with drivenness and pain. So Atman is bound with clinging because of the deep ties between the movement, this is mine, and I am this. So I hold on to possessions to maintain an identity. And as my possessions crumble, so does my identity. And all of this creates pain. And that brings us to the Buddha's primary project. So in, in one discourse, he discusses how our view of Atman plays out. This is in um, Alagadupama Sutta, the simile of the snake, Majjhima 22. So he discusses how our view of Atman plays out, and then he points out what he's actually interested in. Um, he says, previously and now, what I teach is Dukkha and the cessation of Dukkha. That's it. So this is the Buddha as a teacher, cutting through all this philosophical nonsense and getting to what is actually important. So why does he reject the teaching of Atma? Because self and possession go together, clinging to either causes Dukkha. So if we want the cessation of Dukkha, stop clinging to these, let them go. So the Buddha's motive is revealed in this, in this sentence. He just wants people to stop suffering. Now, what happens with us is we tend to get lost in our concepts about Atman and the drives that give it life because it turns out that that's all Atman is. It's a bundle of concepts and drives. And so from the Buddha's perspective, this Atman, this self, that everybody seems so concerned with, has no real basis in experience and it's actually the source of our troubles. But on the other hand, since Atman self is just a bundle of concepts and drives, it provide, provides an entry into our investigation of experience. 
So he's saying, you believe in this Atman, you believe in this self. So what's your experience of it? And from there, the investigation moves in. Having a belief in this self, does it help you cultivate the wholesome and abandon the unwholesome? Or does it get in the way because it encourages clinging to whatever you identify with as self? And for the Buddha, that's the problem. Because if we have a concept of self, it encourages possession and identification, and that causes dukkha. So if you want the cessation of dukkha, let's drop the concept. Okay. Thank you very much. That's it. Phew. Any questions or comments? Yeah, I've just got a question, Patrick. So this Atman all itself is just a, our own construct. Hmm. Yeah. Deeply, um, deeply motivated because it is an organizing principle, like psychologically, uh, if we don't have a sense of self, well, how, how do we live? It's, it's, it's a useful organizing principle. But what we tend to do is we tend to take it as real and not only as real, but the most important thing. And everything else has to be judged against. It. So if things are going well for me, then everything's okay. If things are going badly for me, then things really are going badly. Um, actually, I'm always reminded by the story in the Book of Kings in the Hebrew Bible. Now, the king of Israel was talking to a prophet and he was saying, so what's, what's the news? What's going to happen? And uh, the prophet says, do you want the bad news or the good news? And the king says, we'll start with the, with the bad news. And the prophet said, the Assyrians are going to come out from the north and they are going to utterly devastate your country. They are going to burn your capital, loot everything, destroy the people, cut them off as slaves and reduce Israel to a field of ashes. You can, you can bank on it. And the king says, OK, so what's the good news? And the prophet says, all of this, all of this is going to happen after you're dead. And the king is so delighted he has a big feast to celebrate. <laughs> it's actually in there. But it perfectly illustrates the nature of Atman. It makes perfect sense what that king did from the perspective of Atman. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you very much. I might have a comment. Okay.